Emma, welcome to the Fitness and Lifestyle Podcast. Um, it, I'll, I'll start off by saying it's an absolute pleasure to have you on. I've been so keen to, to have a chat with you um, and just been really excited about the conversation. So, um, yeah, firstly, just a big thank you for coming on. Oh, thank you for having me here. Pleasure. There's, a, there's so much I would like to kind of discuss today and um, and most of it is just selfish reasons because I'm interested in a lot of this stuff, but I think the audience is just going to get so much value from from our chat. And the first thing I wanted to ask you is how your um, definition or how, how you kind of see the word gratitude, how much that has changed over the years and how much it's evolved for you. Yeah, um, gratitude's an interesting one for me personally. Um, I think, you know, uh, for the listeners that don't know my story, um, I'm, I'm jumping straight into it because it, it's sort of, I can't explain my connection to gratitude without explaining my story. Um, uh, five and a half years ago now, my son, so I'm a mum of four kids and my eldest son, two weeks shy of his 14th birthday, he jumped from um, a pier and broke his C5, C6 vertebrae, which left him quadriplegic with no feeling of movement from the chest and shoulders down. And, you know, it was around the time of his accident. You know, spinal cord injury is something that throws you into... Oh, I I describe it like a hurricane. It just throws you into trauma and grief and shock. And on top of that trauma and grief and shock, you have to renovate a house and find carers and look after after three other children. And, um, you know, it's, it's, you cannot explain it. And it was around about that time that gratitude was really. We were starting to hear about it as a tool that we could actually use. Mm. And, um, you know, a lot of people would say to me, you have to, um, you know, be grateful for what you still have, you know, grateful that Will was still alive and grateful that we still had a roof over our heads and, you know, things like that, food on the table. And I, I got that, but it's really... <laughs> It's really a, a difficult concept to think that um, I felt in a funny way people saying be grateful for that, it diminished the pain that I was experiencing. Mm. And then I was torn between this guilt of I should feel grateful because Will's alive, yet I really feel pissed off and yeah. I really feel traumatised and, and I feel in shock. And so then I was like... Um, this mix of guilty and then mix of annoyed at people telling me to be grateful and then really feeling like I was a terrible person that I wasn't grateful. So it all got mixed into one. Massive Um, whirlwind. Yeah. And um, I've told people this story that shortly after Will's accident, I was asked by um, one of the magazines attached to the newspapers, you know, about health and wellbeing, to write an article um, a series of articles, and the first one they wanted to write me to write was gratitude, and I actually wrote this article that gratitude was sort of a bit of rubbish. Well, yep. it was not rubbish. Let me explain that. Just writing down on a piece of paper, I'm grateful for, um, you know, f- having fresh water or I'm grateful for food on my table. Mm. Um, I was saying that just writing that down does not magically make your day better. And it does not make all of your pain and and struggle disappear. And and the reality is that life is rugged for all of us. You don't mm. need spinal cord injury to feel like, you know, life is challenging. Yeah, definitely. And that writing these three things down on a piece of paper was make, supposed to make it better did not make sense for me. So I wrote that on, in the article and uh, the editor politely told me that um, perhaps I could write some articles when I was <laughs> further along my spinal cord injury journal. So she didn't want that message. But um, where I sit now with gratitude is that I absolutely believe we cannot be in two emotional states at one time. So I can't mm-hmm. be in an emotional state around fear. Um, you know, what will it look like for my son? What will... Um, you know, will he ever be independent? Will our family survive? I can't be in that emotional state of fear and looking through the lens of lack and looking through the lens of, um, you know, danger, as well as at the same time looking through a lens of what I do have and what I'm blessed to have. Mm-hmm. So 
I do believe that gratitude is a powerful way to shift emotional states, but it's a feeling. It's not words on a piece of paper to me. That's yeah. You've got to get into that feeling to then um, be able to change that emotional state and go through your day from that emotional state. That was a long answer to one question no, no, at the great. start there's of the a, podcast. There's a, that's awesome. <laughs> it's a great way to start. There's a couple of things I want to unpack from that. So firstly, I mean, obviously to a much lesser degree, I think a lot of people listening you know, that were negatively affected last year by COVID, in mm. a way would probably have felt in the same position. You know, you, if for someone, for example, who may have lost their job or aren't, is unable to see their family members or, or, you know, worst case scenario, had a family member affected by it is sitting at home or whatever in, in full quarantine and lockdown being told to be grateful that they're still alive and stuff but they can't they don't know when they're going to make money again they don't know when they're going to see their family again so I can I feel as though a lot of people would be able to relate to that so what was your process you said it's not about just writing things down it's actually a feeling so is there was there any tools or things that you used to be able to actually feel the gratitude to actually make it happen yeah um well I think and, and talking about COVID I think acceptance is a, a much more appropriate emotional state to get in than gratitude. It's like, you know, some people are really anxious about something and then trying to shift them into a state of positive is too big of a jump. So mm-hmm. let's go from anxiousness to neutral. Let, let's just go from anxiousness to acceptance. Let's yeah. try and just shift a little bit before we go all the way over into this is amazing and I'm great. And really so just sitting it's, with it for a second. And, yeah, yeah, so... Accepting that, you know, it's out of my control being in lockdown, it's out of my control, you know, the government decisions around around the pandemic, it's out of my control, um, you know, what my, you know, neighbours do or friends do and how they approach the, the situation. So acceptance is around saying I don't have to like it and I don't have to agree with other people and I don't have to think it's good, but I just accept that I can't control it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, a big thing, a big first step for me with spinal cord injury was accepting, not accepting that my son was quadriplegic. I'm not sure I even really accept that now. Yep, like that's, yep. you know, I think when we go through trauma and we go through grief and pain, you know, disassociation is a powerful tool to just go, is that really happening? No, yeah. it's not really happening. But accept that, you know, it's out of my control, the trauma and the grief and the, this situation is out of my control. Mm. So I, I, I'm accepting that this situation is out of my control rather than accepting the finer details of it, if that even makes sense. So acceptance is a first place for me, but gratitude... For me, I remember picking up a rock at the when Will was in the Royal Children's Hospital and really feeling that rock and that grounded me into that that was my reminder to actually look through a different lens. Mm-hmm. And so what I would try and do when I was holding that rock, in a funny way meditating, but not sitting down cross legged and meditating, but just going to my breath and really connecting with that we are safe. And we are okay and, you know, that we've got a lot of support around us and that our community, you know, have our backs and that it's not all my responsibility to get through this. And so it's not gratitude like I'm grateful for Mm. the food on my table. It's like, you know, that I'm okay. I've got this. So I'm looking through a lens of what I have rather than what I don't have and what could go wrong. Yeah, a different perspective, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Staying on that topic of... You know, the meditation and the different forms of meditation and how it can be interpreted. I think I saw or heard on a, a podcast or an interview you'd done mentioning how I think it maybe been with the Richmond boys, you'd got them to just go and stand in front of a window and just, just watch, just, just look and just see whatever comes to their mind, comes to their mind and just observe. For those that haven't stepped into the world of meditation, and for some people, I know I've said it on the podcast before, like if you didn't know that I podcasted now, you'd still wouldn't believe you because I, I find it really hard just to sit still or do anything like that but it's been a game changer for me and literally just life changing like it's it's made such a big difference but for a lot of people it's it's more so just like getting their head around yeah. what meditation is and the benefits it can ha- have on them so for someone that is maybe not thinking that they're likely to go and sit down and put their headphones on and just sit there quiet and meditate yeah. listening to an app What's, what do you think are some tools or some ways for someone to get into it and actually get an understanding of what the purpose of it is? Because I think some people think it's to try and 
go to sleep. Some people do it to try and wake up and feel energised and focus. Like it's just there's yeah. a lot of different ways to look at yeah. it. What what have you done? What what style? What got you into meditation? Do you use an app or something like that? I first started. Um, I was just feeling really shit yeah. to be honest. Um, and and finally kind of just said, you know, I got to try meditation. Yeah. So I downloaded the Headspace app and oh, did yeah. just the, the ten days or whatever and. I liked that, but it was kind of initially just a chore. It was like, all right, I'm going to meditate today just so I can say I've done it and would be thinking about everything else while I'm doing it. And then that started to evolve a bit and I, I got more interested in mindfulness and even breath work and stuff. So now I do a lot of um, – I stick with guided meditations usually. So I, I do one in particular quite often by um, Dr. Joe Dispenza, which is like a 20-minute one yeah. I do every morning. His kind of morning sp- meditation one, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I love that. Um, yeah. You know, other days I may literally just do like a Wim Hof breathing technique and just kind of just be super present and just be right on top of my breath. It, it changes up from, from yeah. day to day. But, yeah, yeah, guided meditation usually for me. Yeah. Well, you've sort of answered how I, your journey is what I would sort of explain to someone else as a really good way to move into meditation. Um, let me let me start by explaining what meditation is because mm. I don't I think some people immediately go I'm hopeless at that I can't do meditation I suck at meditation yeah um, you can't be good or bad at med- yeah. meditation it's not like there's it's, a score <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah it's like if you're unfit and have never been to a gym if you go to a gym the first time you try and do sit ups it's going to hurt and mm. you're not going to feel very strong at them it's a bit like that with meditation people wrongly think that they're trying to clear their mind and have no thoughts with meditation. But meditation is a, an, a way that we train our mind. It's like going to the gym for our mind. Yeah. And so we can do that in so many different ways. It doesn't have to look like just 20 minutes sitting still on a mantra. That's one way, but it's not the only way. So if someone hadn't really dipped their toe into meditation before, this is what I would say for them to do. Right now, the world is really busy and it's getting busier and the amount of information we're processing is huge. So most of us live in a very hypervigilant stress state. So most of us are at a level of stress that we're not even noticing anymore. It's become normal. Yeah, it's become normal. Our normal is stressed. And so when we try to sit down with like a meditation app or you know, uh, learning how to meditate, we think we're hopeless at it because our hypervigilant mind is constantly on high alert. Yeah. What about this? Be careful of that. And is throwing all of these dangers at us all of the time. And so the fact that you're getting lots and lots of thought in meditation does not mean you're not good at it. It means you're at a hypervigilant stress state and you probably need it more than other yeah. people. But that can mean that starting meditation quite traditionally can can be difficult because your mind is so um, on high alert and so scattered. And, you know, I was only having a conversation with the Richmond boys like half an hour ago about the fact that when you are on your screens all day, you are training your attention to go from my phone to the conversation to the PlayStation. It's You're training your attention to jump all the time. Mm. And so when you sit down in meditation – it feels very jumpy because that's what you've trained it You're to used do. to it, yeah. So I would tell anyone to start with a breath routine before they jump straight into meditation. Okay. I personally think meditation could be sitting, closed eye meditation should be considered more of an advanced form okay. of meditation to just simple breath work. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, there's Wim Hof. My kryptonite is cold water. You will not get me doing oh, really? Wim Hof in a million years. I own that. Do the cold showers daily. Yeah, no, I won't do it. No? No, I, ca- I can't do it. I'm just I'm terrible at cold water. Can't, can't do it. Can't do it. Um, so I would say to someone a simple breath routine is called a take five breath routine where you simply breathe in for five, you hold for five, you breathe out for five, and you mm. repeat it five times. So it's simply as you breathe in, you can't up to five and then you hold your breath for five release for five now you would do i would recommend to someone to do that multiple times throughout the day and think of every time you do it as a mini meditation but it's like you're taking the rubbish out of your mind it's like you're emptying out the rubbish and if you let the rubbish just build up more and more in your mind then um 
you have stinky thoughts, right? Yeah. And that feels shit. Yeah. And so let's empty out that rubbish continually throughout the day. So a take five as soon as you wake up, a take five after lunch before you go back to your mm. sitting down in an office or take five on your way to the gym in, in the evening, yep. you know, a take five before bed. So you're starting to get this practice of calming your mind down. Yeah. And once we calm that mind down, then it's easier to sit in a, a form of meditation. You can do a headspace. You can do a Buddha Fi, uh, which is another app. Yeah. There's another app called Insight Timer where you get to sort of, there's all different um, people around the world who place meditations on that. Joe Dispenza, I mm. love those. That were, they're all sort of more guided meditations yeah. that are a bit easier. Um, I sent an athlete off recently to learn transcendental meditation yeah. that you can learn through TM Australia, but don't. Well, no, I'm not going to say don't start there. Like, oh, my gosh, if you want to start there, like, go for it. But be kind to yourself and know that this is something that you have to train yeah, yeah, and yeah. get practice at and you might find it easier if you start with a breath routine. Yeah. Taking uh, – just quickly taking a step back before we keep moving forward. Um, how have you found, like, dealing with all the, the stress and, and, like you said, the trauma of what happened with Will? Like, how have you found now – being able to adapt qu- more quickly, I guess, to things that are quite stressful or that do throw you off. Because I think, you know, like the saying goes, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. Like, but it's it's very similar to stress in general life. Like it's all well and good to meditate, write down your goals in the morning, sit, you know, gratitude journal, all that stuff. And this happens to me a lot. And then something goes wrong and all of a sudden that shit goes out the window and you, you, you're back to square one again. It feels like it anyway. So... How are you able to kind of get yourself back to centre and, and, and present as quickly as possible, even if there is something that really bothers you or, or kind of throws you off? Yeah. Um, I remember, like, when we was injured, I'd been a mindfulness teacher for, or, like, qualified in mindfulness for, oh, you know, 20-odd years. Mm-hmm. And um, I had taught mindfulness very traditionally as mindfulness-based stress reduction, which is all about, you know, reducing stress and promoting relaxation which is really hard when you're in the grips of trauma Mm. and shock and grief like to actually relax and um you know be less stressed is really 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 difficult and so i remember when will was in icu in a coma and i was doing a walking meditation up and down the hallway not to be some you know uber awesome mindfulness teacher for survival like it was like if i don't necessity stay right here in this moment i'm not going to get up like Mm -hmm. what sat on either side of that moment was horrific like why did i let him go to the beach why was i not there had i educated him properly about jumping off a pier like they're all the things that were sitting if i delved into you know the past yeah and if i looked into the future it was horrific, like, what it looked like for us. So I remember doing this, um, you know, walking meditation. And for those that don't know what that means is, it's it's a mindfulness practice where literally you are holding your attention in the present moment by giving it a job, effectively. Mm-hmm. So it's like, hey, attention, can you check out my feet as I, you know, touch the floor mm-hmm. and... Can you feel my hips as they move and can you feel my shoulders? So I'm just walking up and down the hallway of of the hospital, um, keeping my attention on those things so it didn't go to what if Will dies tonight because at that stage he was in a coma and we were told that may not make it through the night. And I remember having a moment as I was doing this and I had to work so hard to keep my attention in the present moment because what sat on either side of it was so scary that I thought to myself, oh, oh, this is mindfulness. You know, I've been teaching it yeah. for, <laughs> for so long, but oh, now I get it. Now yeah. I get what they mean by paying attention like your life depends on it, really keeping um, that in the present moment. But I think for me, going back to your question, what enables me to come back when it all goes horribly wrong. And I I know for people, you know, they start their morning with a green smoothie and then I journal and then I do this and then I do that. You know, 
those things are amazing and they're going to set you up for a great day. And and how you set up your day is typically how yeah. your day ends, you yeah. know. If you end if your day ends pretty crappy, it's because you started your day crappy. Yeah. So it's really that stuff is really important in life, but you will find yourself in circumstances where you can't. Like you're sleeping on the bed of a you know, on a couch in the Royal Children's Hospital for six months, you can't yep. have that perfect day. Yeah. And so for some people listening, they're trying, they're waiting for the perfect routine to give them the relief they yep. are looking for from yep. the struggle, if yep. that makes sense. Mm-hmm. It's like when I finally get to the gym every day, meditate, have a green smoothie, journal, then yep. all of these struggles will disappear. Yeah. Well, they won't. No at all um and so for me truly believing and um living the fact that in the present moment there is no struggle it's um you know it's like well how can you say that because you know your son is a quadriplegic how can you say there's no struggle in the in the present moment what I was able to do was go right here, right now. I'm just having a conversation with my son. There's no struggle in that. Yep. The struggle actually sits on either side of that in all the stories, the what if stories and the if only stories. And so it's learning the art of catching yourself when you've gone to those stories yeah. and picking up your attention and just coming back into the present moment. And you need to learn how to do that. If that's one thing I could tell these listeners is – you, you were just telling me about your naughty puppy, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So if you took, took your puppy to a dog park, mm-hmm. how would she or he? He. How would he go at the dog park if you let him off the lead? He'd love it. He'd just go? He, he'd hang around, but he'd have a great time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nice, and yeah. he would go to that smell and that yeah. dog and everything else. Now, if you said going to the park, right, my dog is going to sit by my feet today and not move. Mm. Now, just because you've said that does not mean your dog's going to do that. Yeah. You actually have to train your dog to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To give him treats, call yeah. him back, teach him to come back, teach him to sit, teach him to stay. Yeah, yeah. So it's a bit like people go, right, I'm going to be more present. I'm going to be more mindful. If you don't actually train, train that skill, <laughs> yeah. just because you want to be more present and more mindful... It's like it doesn't um, work like that. Yeah, it's it's funny. It was like like the law of attraction. Like yeah. you know, a lot of people that have read or watched the secret, it's kind of like all this. I think I think um, maybe even Doctor D Martini mentioned this in our chat. He's kind of like you know people watch it or read it and think that they can just wake up and say I'm going to be a millionaire. And there's going to be checking the mail tomorrow, but then they have a horrible work ethic. They're not doing anything that is going to put them in that direction of, of making that happen, but that is expected to happen. It, unfortunately, it just doesn't work like that. Like, you need to do the work. You need to at least be giving yourself the best chance for the, you know, to be present. Um, if, if you're not doing any of the work, it's just not going to happen. Oh, like I couldn't agree and you're also, with that more. And you're yeah. also then making matters worse for yourself because you've got this big expectation of being present just because you've you've done a morning routine or because you know you've had your green smoothie or whatever it is and when yeah. it doesn't happen you're constantly disappointed. Yeah, and and again it goes back to that very first thing we talked about with gratitude, me saying it's a feeling. Yeah. Um, I believe, you know, when we talk about that manifesting and attracting things into your life, if you're not in the right feeling, yep. and remember our thoughts dictate our feelings, but sometimes our feelings dictate our thoughts, they can go either way. But together those thoughts and feelings dictate our actions. So you see people going, well, I wrote a check for you know $10 million, so now I'm going to get a check for $10 million. And then they sit in the thoughts and the feelings of, well, why isn't that happening to me? That never happens to me. You know, like I'm supposed to, I'm follow, I've lis- watched The Secret and I've listened to mm-hmm. D Martini and, you know, it's yeah. not fair because no things ever happen right for me. And so they're really <laughs> sitting in the thoughts and the feelings that are laden with fear. And so what I say is when we sit in thoughts and feelings that, okay, I'm, you know, I did, I'm worthy of getting that money, yeah. I'm prepared to do whatever it takes to get that money, I'm excited by getting that money, I'm, you know, I'm ready for it. And, and then we show up with the thoughts and the feelings that see the opportunities, yeah. that work hard for the opportunities, that... that um, had those conversations with people that you know you wouldn't have if you weren't looking for ways to make that yeah, money. Yeah, you're so, putting yourself in that position. Yeah. It's it's funny. Um, 
I don't want to continue referring to other podcasts, but no, I was I was listening or watching a podcast yesterday with Big Sean, the yeah. rapper with Jay Shetty, and like it was incredible. It was way better than what I expected. <laughs> but he was he was kind of talking about the whole manifestation and law of attraction, and you know, if you, people that are constantly complaining or, or again putting themselves in a position and using the language as if like nothing happens for them, like why isn't this working for me? Blah blah. blah. He, he's like it's literally like standing in front of him. like he used the example of God. And whatever you say, he will give you. So if you're standing in front of him going like, I have no money, this sucks, I'm so poor, he's like, yeah, cool, you're poor. Whereas you reframe that like you just said. And and then you start to think like that too. Like that's the whole part of the whole thing with manifestation is like genuinely feel like you are in that situation, genuinely feel like this is already happening instead yeah, of yeah. it's going to or you hope it happens. Like yeah. make, lead yourself to believe that it is happening, yeah. that it has happened. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I feel our family does a really good job of um, looking through the lens with Will's injury of, um, you know, that we would give it back any day, but it 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 is here and mm-hmm. we look at the good things it brings into our lives. And, and, you know, big things happening to you also bring big opportunities yeah. and open different doors and allow you to have different conversations when you're looking through the right lens when yeah. you're looking through okay well this sucks and it's terrible but let's look at what we can do rather than yeah. what we can't do what we can't do yeah. then you put yourself in a position to have those conversations with people and then before you know it they're telling you about a great trainer who knows this particular technique and yeah. you're having conversations that lead you to of you know, opportunities and you're prepared to do work that opens doors that then all of a sudden people look at you and go, oh, well, you're so lucky. Things always work out for you. You know, you've yeah. got access to some rehab that other people don't get. It's like, well, and, and I'm making this up. Like yeah, this yeah. is not, we don't yeah. have access to some yeah, yeah, <laughs> secret yeah. rehab. But it's like, well, no, we were, look, we were sitting through, well, what can we do with this mm-hmm. situation yeah. and what... You, you know, had to put yourself in a position for that to be a possibility. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and also look through the lens and sit in the energy of of that we can make good of this really shitty, you know, situation. Yeah, you obviously work with some really high level athletes, and um, and, and I think this applies not only for athletes but people in the corporate world, people in general, just everyday life. How how important or how much of an impact do you think? Um, you know, reframing the way you see or think about things or, or you know, trying to, to change, I guess, your self-limiting beliefs has, uh, like how much of an impact does that have on our life in either a negative or positive way, depending on how we look at certain things? Oh, I think it's everything. Um, you know, it, for those people who haven't heard that word reframe before, mm. what reframe means is like looking at something in a different way. So turning, changing the story in a way that um, better suits us. Yep. So I don't like to think of thoughts like as positive or negative. Okay. I tend to think of them as helpful or unhelpful. So particularly with athletes, it's mm-hmm. like that's either going to help you perform it the best, the way you're looking at that, or it's going to not help you perform at your best. Yep. Um, because a lot of athletes have thoughts that on the surface are, you know, positive um, thoughts, mm-hmm. but they're not going to help them perform. So an athlete, you know, in a team environment might walk into a meeting and go, oh, you know, I played well on the weekend, so I don't really need to listen to this meeting because, you know, I'm playing so well at the moment. It's not a negative thought, but it's not really going to help you perform at your best. So, And it's going to limit you to the information you already know and not open open you up to new information. So we're talking about constantly taking – and – it's important for the listeners to understand that our mind does not go to helpful thinking by itself. Like that's not it's our not go default, to way. Yeah. <laughs> that's not our default no. at all. Our default is unhelpful thinking because that's what keeps us safe. Like our mind wants to look at something in a very closed way, in a very limited way, in a way that is like, you know what, I just want you to look for the exit strategy Mm -hmm. and get the hell out of here. Like I don't want to look at what the opportunity is in this struggle. I just want to see, you know, how you're going to get out of this struggle. Alive, 
with as much energy as you can help, you know, that you can contain to keep the human race alive. That's how we are wired. That's how we're programmed. And so our go-to thinking is very unhelpful when it comes to performance. It's very Mm -hmm. helpful when it comes to survival, but not very helpful when it comes to performance. Because if your performance is requiring you to take a massive risk, you know, and that risk for an athlete might be putting their head over the ball, but that risk for... Um, a listener might be asking a, a you know out of the box question in a meeting or presenting creative ideas yep. that people might judge you know or it yeah. might be you know doing a presentation when you're nervous about doing a presentation so performing at our best is quite often surrounded by enormous risk to our mind yeah. and it wants us to look at all of the bad all of the dangerous so when we can actually stop and reframe the way we are, are looking at it and to something more helpful, helpful. not positive. This is where people go yeah. wrong. They go to, I can do this. And then yeah. their mind's like, well, no, you can't. You've never done it before. Yeah. What's the evidence of that? Like, yeah. get out of here. Don't get up and ask that question in this meeting. Yeah, That's yeah. ridiculous. Remember when Sally did? That yeah. didn't go too well. So <laughs> it's it's reframing it to go, well, you know, I've done lots of work and I know my information and, you know, when I'm visible at work, then I get more opportunities. Yeah. And so it's it's reframing it into something that gives us more potential to fulfil our best performance. Are you able to give us an example, and you don't have to name the player or the specific situation or whatever, but are you able to give us an example of how an athlete that you've worked with who you've seen the most growth in, in that respect, like someone who was, you know, that did have some pretty big self-limiting beliefs or, or was re- or was framing things probably in an unhelpful way where now they've been able to flip it around they've seen huge progress in, in terms of, you know, just as a person but also as an athlete? Yeah, so, um, I mean, every athlete I work with, that's pretty yeah. much their, their story. Um, but, you know, if I think off the top of my head – a motorsport driver by the name of Scott McLaughlin, you know, I, I just thought motorsport was the most ridiculous sport. Like, they cars drive around a track really fast and I'm like, I don't get the appeal of that. And so a driver by the name of Scott McLaughlin reached out to me um, or Jack Rewalt from Richmond suggested that he reach out to me. Yep. Scott's story was that in 2000 and 17, he lost the unlosable championship. He's that talented, this kid, and well, he's not really a kid, but this guy's really talented. He was winning this championship, supercar championship, by a mile. All he had to do in the final race of the season was come 11th, and he'd win the whole championship, yep. you know, get all the glory, everything else. <laughs> and he went into the last race of the season, you know, with that really unhelpful thinking of... Yep. I don't want to do this. I've just got to get to the end safe. That was, that was yeah. a massive one. Like, just finish. Mm-hmm. Like, just finish. So, you know, that's a big one for athletes. Like, just get – I'm in front, so just, you know, don't – Just get through. Just yeah, get yeah. through, right? Yeah. So he's like, just finish, get it done. Did not want to race at all. Was wanted to – he talks about it publicly, wanting to – he was standing on the start line before they get into their car, looking at the championship trophy that pretty much had his name on it, yeah. thinking, I just want to get out of here. So he, his mind is looking for that exit strategy mm-hmm. and he's telling his mind, just get to the end. And he made every conceivable mistake you can make in a motorsport race yep. and he came 12th and he lost the whole championship. And um, so when he came to me, his whole thinking was based on winning and a lot of athletes are on that. Yep. And, you know, you go, well, yeah, shouldn't they be focused on winning? But really they're focused in a way that is, again, laden with that fear, like what if I don't win? It's all on an outcome. Yeah, it's all on an outcome. And it's all, you know, as soon as you put your focus and your thoughts all attached to this outcome, the wiring of our mind goes, well, what if I don't get that outcome? Yep. So this is bad. This yeah. is terrible. And so it wants to look for an exit strategy. It, it's like I can't control that, so, oh, my gosh, I must be on high, high alert for everything that's bad. And so for, for Scott, it was really about reframing his thinking off that outcome onto well, what does best execution look like for me? We talk about best execution a lot for athletes 
and corporate executives yeah. and students sitting mm-hmm. in year 11 and 12. It's like when you sit down, what do you need to do to best execute the process here? What do you need to do to best execute this exam? I need to breathe. I need to stay calm. I need to read the question clearly. Yep. I need to. So it's sticking to best executing the process rather than thinking about the outcome. The outcome, yeah. And really attaching, looking at the strengths that you can bring to that process that enable you to best execute. So Scott, uh, you know, and again we go back to, he was prepared to do the work. Yep. He was prepared to start going through every day, even when he wasn't at the track, catching his mind when it went to that unhelpful thinking. Yeah. Catching his thoughts, you know, that were limiting him. And he was prepared to catch them and reframe them. So he was teaching himself the skill to do that all of the time. So he could do it in a car under that extreme pressure. And I love Scott's story because Scott went on and won three back-to-back supercar championship. And he won Bathurst. And he got a contract in IndyCar, which is America's fastest car. Now, on the weekend... What Scott did, he was racing in his third ever IndyCar race. So he's gone from – it's like going from soccer to AFL. Like it's yeah. two different – like it's a car, mm. but it's two completely different yeah. cars. Supercars are at like 320k an hour. This is like at 400k an hour. It's like an open-air car, whole different track. He was on his very first ever oval track on the weekend and he came second. It's unreal. Now, that was a guy who, you know, his employee, Penske, was like, just lower your expectations. Just all you have to do is come in and, you know, just get a feel for it. Yeah. But that's not helpful thinking, no. is it? Not right? helpful, yeah. It's like, no, I best execute. Yeah. And I don't know what that best execution is going to do. Result in, yeah. Result in. Yeah. But he sat in that energy and that feeling of I have everything I need to best execute. I don't know what that will look like. Mm-hmm. And I know best execution will get better better and better the more work I put in and the more skilled I get at this sport. But I am brutal on staying focused on best executing this process. And I come second. Yeah. Because we have so much more talent and ability and potential than we're using. Yeah. Because we're It's funny, isn't it? It's like uh, it's a bit of a balancing act. Like it's it's you on one hand you kind of have someone who over like expects everything to go extremely well and is is that outcome focused person who just expects to win blah 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 and on the other hand you have someone who's just undervaluing their talent undervaluing what they're capable of a matter of finding that that balance when is this kind of like i guess in a nutshell uh high performance mindfulness like when we when when we use that term and, and obviously um you're so good at what you do is this is this what you're kind of prescribing to, for, for an athlete, as you've talked about before, whether it is someone in the corporate world, whether it's someone at school, whether it's someone that's going to their day-to-day job or even someone that just sets out to achieve a, a goal in everyday life, is this is this kind of the process? Is it focusing on executing those, those yeah. things day after day? Yeah, it, it is that and it's learning the process of how to do that. So mm. that term high-performance mindfulness is a term that for me – you know, when I learnt mindfulness very traditionally, mindfulness comes out of Buddhism where, you know, Buddhist monks were striving for enlightenment and non-attachment to, you know, anything in this earthly plane that we live in. And then, well, Scott McLaughlin's in a car wanting to win a championship. They don't really match up. But the concept of being present, which mindfulness is based in, is really important. But to do that we maybe don't need to focus so much on reducing that stress and promoting that relaxation as opposed to we need to become present first. Mm -hmm. And that is a process in itself. We have to catch ourselves, I call it a B game, when we're in this wild B game. We need to catch that. We need to become present. We need to use that acceptance. But we then need to know how to get over into that, pick up that focus and put it on best execution. And... um, you know, that is something that will look different for you yep. to me and, you know, because your B game will look different to mine. You might be someone who really retreats and go pa- get, goes very passive. I go very whingy and very victim. Someone else will go very aggressive. So we have to be able to catch that yep. and then shift it so that we can deliver our best performance. Yeah, so there's a big, uh, there's a big amount of self-awareness there that needs to, to come you into play. You can't do any of it without self-awareness. Like if we 
I, you know, there's just so much to talk about on this topic because we are just going through our day habitual, you know, like yeah. we just go through autopilot. Every, from, autopilot from the time the snooze button goes off. We have the same thought that gives us the same feeling that leads to the same action. You know, yep. if you're a listener out there and you get to your office desk and you put your bag down and then you get the same coffee cup and you do this and it's because it's all happening on autopilot. Mm-hmm. But what we're doing is we go through our day on autopilot desperately wishing and praying and hoping that it feels different tomorrow yeah, and that I get a different result tomorrow and I get that promotion or I actually feel motivated to go to the gym. But, but we don't do anything differently. Yeah. We don't implement anything that's going to change our thoughts or change our feelings. They need to be deliberate, um, deliberate processes, actions, yeah. deliberate actions that we can't just make up. Someone needs to teach us like that. Yep. You can't just, yep. you know, I can't hand you a ukulele now and say play me a song if you've never played one before. I need to teach you how to do that. I can't teach you how to do that. By Luckily, way. I know how to play one. Oh, do you? No, I don't. No, uh, no, no, I don't. <laughs> um, yeah, so I just I feel for everyone yeah. out there. They're like, you know, I, oh, I saw I was standing behind this guy in a supermarket and he had a, a big supermarket chain um, shopping bag that had like mindful vegetables written on it like you know the name of the supermarket yep. delivering you my you know your yeah, yeah. mindful vegetables it's like what the fuck <laughs> like you know it's no wonder we're so confused yeah that's you know, right if you're out there expecting your vegetables to somehow yeah my deliver you mindfulness they're yeah. not i hate to break it to you they're not yeah or the people that say oh yeah no my jogging is my mindfulness my run my morning run is my mindfulness and then they start their run and they spend the next hour in conversations that haven't yet happened and going through their to-do lists and making up movies around the bad shit that's going to happen, the mistake they made yesterday. It's like that's not mindfulness. That's going for a run and really being very active in your mind. Yeah, and that's one thing that I think a lot of people that haven't taken a step into the world of, of, you know, we'll use the word again, mindfulness, Mm -hmm. um, is probably what a lot of people struggle with is the unknown of what even is it. Yeah. Because it's not like you say to someone, oh, I need you to start running. It's pretty straightforward what a fucking going for yeah. a run is. But yeah. with mindful, that's the thing. It, a lot of people kind of look at it and think that there is no actionable steps. There is no you – know, even listening to this episode, today, I think a lot of people will, will walk away from it having a better understanding of actual things that they can start implementing as of right now that are going to help them on that journey. When I want to touch on, on Richmond for a second. My old man's a big Richmond fan, so I'd be, he'd be shattered if I didn't <laughs> didn't bring it up. Um, and we we're fortunate enough to have Koch on the show not long ago, um, so we kind of touched on it a bit. But what what were some of the biggest, um, like a, I guess, red flags you saw one like once you started with Richmond, and then also some things that you got them to implement to, to really obviously completely turn around the pathway that the club was going on, and and now be pretty much the powerhouse of the AFL. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure um, you know Koch can speak about his role more than I can speak about his role. But um, to set the scene for those who aren't Richmond fans, uh, Richmond were 13th on the ladder in 2016 and there was a lot of noise in in the public space about the captain being sacked, the coach being sacked, the board being thrown out and a whole rebuild starting. You know, they hadn't won a final for 37 years and they were sort of getting worse. And... So between 2016 and 17, something had to change because they didn't do any of those things. They didn't sack the board or coach Mm -hmm. or bring massive new superstars in. And so I guess what the very first catalyst was that Koch, the captain, and Dimmer, the the coach, they, to the group, effectively said, you know what, we've been going around this about this on the the wrong way and we've been focusing on what we don't have, our weaknesses, you know, the result, the numbers and we're not going to focus on that anymore. I'm I'm putting it in very plain words here. Um, And we're going to make it all about the journey and celebrating everyone's strengths and about the people and, and trust that our best results will come from that. Now, I want the listeners to really understand what that did because we hear people like Brene Brown talk about vulnerability. Yeah. 
And I think people get confused. What does that mean? Do I have to share with people what happened to me as a child? And I go into a workplace and I share my my childhood and my deep personal secrets and why isn't my t- team performing better? I thought that was – Brene Brown promised me that when I was vulnerable. Mm-hmm. What Dima and Koch did in that moment when they were vulnerable – was they made it safe in the environment. They basically said, hey, I'm not perfect. I don't have all the answers. I don't get it right all the time. And so what that immediately did for the players, it said, it's okay if you don't have all the answers, if you don't get it right all the time, Mm -hmm. if you're struggling. And so once they set up that safe environment, now you're working with a group that's really engaged and a group who are willing to try things they haven't tried before, take risks that they haven't yeah. taken before. So if you're a manager listening to this and you start sharing vulnerability around, and it might be as simple as like, mm, I'm not sure the answer to that. Like, I don't know. Oh, I got that wrong. I should have told you this and I made that poor decision. Once you do that, then your staff start to, and your team start to feel confident to – maybe present something more creative, maybe ask a question where they wouldn't have asked before because they feel safe that you're not going to judge them because you've also said that, hey, I didn't quite get that right. And we talk about this a lot in high-performance mindfulness because, you know, to enable a team to become very mindful and very present, you need to learn those skills and to learn those skills you need in an environment that says, hey, we've got you back, it's okay, we're going to give you the time, the space to make Mm. mistakes, get it right try new ways to approach things, you know, try and break those habitual thoughts and feelings that aren't serving you well. And so that was a, that was a major catalyst. But my work um, really sat in that performance space. And so already now I had a pliable group that I was working with because mm-hmm. the leadership and the, the culture had sh- shifted yeah. around that. So now you have a group that's like maybe thinking, oh, I don't have to go onto a football field terrified because when we sit on the other side of a television screen and we point fingers at players that miss a kick and tell them they're soft and they're not working hard enough, what people should understand is these these players are terrified. Like, yeah. you know, the, the judgment on them and yeah. the criticism of them and, you know, they are playing with a level of fear. Athletes, all athletes are competing with a level of fear that many of us, you know, won't ever really experience, yeah. you know. And so they are making mistakes quite often because their focus is on that exit strategy and not on best execution, and we then criticise them and make them worse. But so now I had a group that were actually open-minded to, well, perhaps this could look different this yep. year. And so then we started with the most basic, basic, and, you know, we did a refresh of it today actually, this really basic concept of having one focus and that your one focus is going to leave the present moment and it's going to go to the bad stories and it's going to go to the fear and it's going to jump off all the time and yeah. we have to train it to come back into come this back. present moment. And so we just played a simple game of catch your attention, which is literally in all parts of your life starting to catch that attention and come back into the present moment. And then we build it from there. And, you know, these boys finally started seeing the relationship between mindset and skill set and that's such a critical point Mm. we think if we're not getting our best results we need to do more like more training more gym work more you know more study yeah yeah, more you know professional development so we're putting into this skill set box not realizing that this skill set box sits within a bigger box called mindset and it's actually how our mindset operates that determines the effectiveness of that skill set. Of the skill set. So it's like, you know what, if you're not getting what you want out of your skill set, perhaps you've got to put it into your mindset because that's determining how you bring that skill set. And these boys just bought into it and mm. we just sort of all went on a journey together and, um, you know, got present and then really nailed this concept of best execution down because your best execution in your job will be different yeah. to mine. Yeah, for sure. A forwards will be different to a backs. Yep. Then we look at the anchor of what's going to get you um, into 
that best execution. So what I mean by an anchor is a particular movement or a particular word that is going to pick up your attention and focus and put okay. it on your best. So okay. we'll Use it. Do you, have you heard of anchors before? Or Not really, no. Oh. Would you like to know about anchors? Oh, about yeah, anchors? I would like to, yeah. <laughs> um, would the listeners like to know about anchors? Probably. Like, it's really yeah. fascinating. Um, I'm sure someone listening is a coffee drinker and a smoker. Um, have you had any clients that are coffee drinkers and smokers? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So they tend to wake up and have a coffee and a cigarette as their yep. first go-to. And so what we say is um, there's an anchor between those two because every single day they've had a coffee with a cigarette. So by repeating that pattern over and over again, they have anchored them together. Okay. And so what m- happens is when they go through their day, whenever they t- taste a coffee or smell a coffee, they crave a cigarette. The association with a cigarette, Because yeah. they're anchored together. And that's not imaginary, that's literally happening at a biological level because yep. they've joined them together like that. And so for an athlete or for anyone I- I- who is trying to uh, speak in public or become, you know, take action on something, we can create an anchor between a particular movement and a feeling. So let's say um, a small forward in football when he gets up on his toes and he says to himself, fast and light, that when he repeats that at the same time as doing it and at the same time as best execution, best executing his running patterns, they all get joined together. So when it's a grand final and he's shitting himself yeah. and he's like, oh, my God, oh, my God, when he gets up on his toe and toes and he says, fast and light, it's like that cigarette and coffee yeah. – his mind just instantly, at a biological level, produces feelings of calm, mm-hmm. puts his focus on the ball and the running patterns, and it goes from there. Yeah. But you need to train it. Like, yeah. you don't have one cigarette and a coffee and boom, there's an anchor. Yeah, yeah, You exactly. do it every single day. Yeah. So It's uh, similar to, uh, I don't know if you've uh, heard or seen much of Brendan Burchard's yep. um, content before. He, he, he talks about, like, I think he uses one, which sounds very similar, like a doorway, like every time, supposedly every time he walks through a doorway, he has like this kind of anchor, I guess it is, yeah. in his head that he kind of reminds himself of and has all different different things that he that he does, which are quite similar. Which what what do you, Are you big on, on um, what's the word for it? Uh, like, so at the end of the day, so for example, like I do my journal in the morning and at the end of the day I go back through review is the word I was trying to think of. Yep. I do a review. Say, for example, um, just staying on the topic of Richmond, so they go from being absolutely nowhere to, to winning a flag. After winning that flag, is there a big review of, of what did work well or what, what they would attribute to, to their success throughout that year where they make sure they're doing those things again the following year or is it rocking up the following preseason and going, all right, what do we want to focus on now? Not doesn't necessarily have to be what it was the last year. Yeah, um, so... Every football club does a review at yep. the end of the year. It's funny, when you win a grand final, you probably do less of a review because, yeah, you're happy yeah. and off you go and go on your holiday yeah. and, and everything else. And before you know it, pre-season starts again. Whereas the teams where it really hurt probably spend more time looking at what worked, didn't what work didn't well, work. Yeah. Um, I, what I think has been really powerful for Richmond is that they review each game, not just the skill set of the game, but they review the mindset of the game. And this is where I think people get tripped up. You know, we have these thoughts that make us feel a particular way and these thoughts and these feelings lead us to make particular actions. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, like, let's say we have a thought of... um, uh, (sighs) Let me use an example. Like I stand on a scale yep. and I've been going to the gym every day and I've been eating this food and I stand on the scale and the number doesn't change. And so I have a thought of like, I can never lose weight. This yeah. is no good for me. Or well, this doesn't work. Or this doesn't yep. work. And then I feel very heavy and then I go and I eat a packet of Tim Tams. You know, I feel very crap, heavy, deflated, unmotivated and I yep. go and have a packet of Tim Tams. And then we look at the action and we just beat ourselves up about the action and we're like, oh, that was crap, I'm, you know, 
I'm terrible and so then we promise we're never going to buy Tim Tams again. <laughs> and we never actually review what we were thinking and what we were feeling. Yep. And when we spend more time reviewing and critiquing what we were thinking and what we were feeling, then the actions sort of take care of itself. Okay. So I would encourage someone in that Tim Tam example to look back, well, what were you thinking when you hopped on the scale? Mm-hmm. And how did that thought feel in your body? And it's like, oh, I was thinking I'm no good and it's never going to work and I felt really deflated and I felt really unmotivated and then I ate the Tim Tams. So it's trying to look at, well, how could I, when I have that thought next time, how could I catch that and reframe that? Okay, yeah. So I might catch that and ask myself a question like, well, what's the truth of the situation? The truth of the situation is I feel better because I'm going to the gym and eating good food and it's not about the number. Mm -hmm. The truth is that, you know, I'm doing all the work and and we know my trainer tells me if I continue to do that, it's a long process and the truth is my clothes are lighter, you know. So if we go back to where it all went horribly wrong at the thought, then that we can change that feeling, then we can change yeah. that action. But sometimes we need to get it wrong to take the learnings from that moment into the next. So yeah, we yeah. eat the packet of Tim Tams, we throw our hands up in the air and go, I'm hopeless, I can't diet, you know, I'm just not cut out for this. And then we just spiral out of control. We yep. have one bad day, I'm telling you, you turns do this for a, a little, turns into a week, a month and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. We've done the Tim Tam episode, right? So we've done it. Rather than just it turning into a week, actually stop. And I use that word stop as part of high-performance mindfulness a lot. Like just stop. Let me critique. Let me look back. What was I thinking? Okay, well, I can see how that led to my Tim Tam episode. Accept it. It's happened. Mm -hmm. What can I do next time? Okay, next time I'm going to catch that thought. And I'm going to reframe that thought. And then I'm going to do my take five breathing. Yeah. And if after my take five breathing, then I want the Tim Tams, well, yeah, yeah. you know, we'll go from it there. But we don't. We just look at the action and we beat ourselves up about the action. Yeah. Oh, my gosh, we're so critical to ourselves about our actions. Yeah. We're hopeless. We're not good enough. We're not cut out for this. You know, we're never going to be able to do this. Yeah. And then that beating ourselves up leads to us feeling having even – more shit feelings, more shit thoughts. Yep. Now we're eating cheese platters, drinking wine. <laughs> it all goes down. And that's where I get hired. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then we call Dan. Yeah. <laughs> well, this has been awesome. I literally could keep going for another hour, two hours, but um, I'm sure you've got somewhere to be. I'll be mindful of your time. So, Emma, thank you so much for, for coming in today. Um, I, I've thoroughly enjoyed the chat and I, I reckon the listeners are just going to get so much value out of our conversation. Um, so a massive thank you to you, firstly. Thank you. I appreciate it. And Can fam- I say yes. before I go, because um, it's a big thing for me, only yesterday um, I uh, – launched my first high performance mindfulness amazing program for students fantastic everyone. haven't got to the everyone yet that's uh, all right we'll get to corporate execs and and athletes but um you know it's i, I look at students and i know that it's really hard it's yeah. stressful and since covid you know they're trying to manage so much so all of these tools are there for a student um and they can jump on the high performance mindfulness website and amazing. I've got a, a bunch there. of a bunch of clients who, particularly last year, um, would come into sessions probably just as stressed as what the the kids were because they were trying to go through exams and and study and and yeah. a bunch of different stuff. And it's hard enough at the best of times. Yeah, it is. Um, so I'll I'll um I'll grab the links and stuff for that and have yeah, it in the cool. show notes below. So if yeah. everyone who's um who's interested in that, uh, whether you've got kids or whether there's someone that you know could could benefit from it. Um, be sure to visit that link and I'll have the links to all of your socials and stuff in, in the yeah, show notes as well. Awesome. For everyone who has enjoyed today's episode, which I'm sure you've loved it, um, please do take a screenshot for me. Tag us on your socials, post on Instagram story, tag myself, tag Emma, um, check out all of her content. It's uh, it's incredible and hopefully we can have you on again. Yes, um, we'd love At that. some point in the future. Yeah. Awesome. All right, guys, thank you so much for tuning in and really looking forward to chatting to you in the very next episode.